Hi everyone, welcome to Age of Warhammer. My name is Grohl, and today we're going to be having a quick look at the new core rulebook for Age of Sigmar Warcry. Now this is actually the, the core book that we got inside the, the Heart of Gur box set. If you haven't seen that unboxing, then please check that out. Um, now I'm not going to be going through everything in the rulebook because to be honest, a lot of it is the same as the old one. So I'm only going to be going over some of the new stuff. Uh, and also I'm going to go through the narrative campaign section at the end, which is very, very exciting for us. Um, so let's get started. So obviously the first thing that we know is new, uh, which let me just find here, page 71 is the reactions. Um, now every single person, sorry, every war band has got universal reactions. Um, and these are completely new. Um, these weren't in the original rule sets at all. And this is basically things that you can do in reaction to something that your opponent does, um, basically. So there's three universal ones, which I'm gonna go through each one of these with you now. Um, and then each, there's also some for specific war bands and also for specific grand alliances as well. Um, but if I just go through the universal one, so the first one is counter. Now we saw this one on, on Warhammer Community, um, but it is basically where if someone, so I'll, I'll read it out to you. Um, a fighter can make this reaction after they are targeted by a melee attack action, but before the hit rolls are made. For each hit roll from that attack action misses, allocate one damage point to the attacking fighter. So every time they miss, they take one damage. But if the hit roll is a one, they actually take two damage. So I mean, that really can be quite powerful. If you're, you know, if you've got someone that's already very low on wounds attacking and you do that counter, you, you could take them out very easily, especially if they, they, they do high amounts of attacks. Um, every single miss, they take one damage. It's, it's brutal, to be completely <laughs> honest. So, so that's a really, really good one. Um, the next one is take cover, and this is exactly as you'd think it would be. So, a fighter that is in cover, um, which basically in Warcry just means if there's a piece of cover, um, like, you, you know, the whole draw imaginary line from your model to their model, if it passes through a bit of cover, then they're in cover, basically. Um, so if a fighter that is in cover, in cover, can make this reaction after they are targeted by a missile attack action, but before the hit rolls are made. After the hit rolls have been made, roll a dice for each critical hit. On a four plus, that critical hit becomes a hit instead. Um, and it, it doesn't work for fighters that are mounted, um, for obvious reasons, because they can't really be in cover. So, so that's a really, really good one. I mean, a lot of the attack characteristics you see um, well, the, where you've got the damage characteristics of the weapon, obviously the critical is sometimes much, much higher. It's not only just like one or two. There's some where, you know, the normal attacks do say, for example, two damage and the critical is like five. You know, some of them are double or even more. So that could potentially, and it's a four plus, which is 50-50. So that could potentially, you know, save fighters easily. So that's a really, really good one. Uh, and then the last one, strike them down. A fighter can make this reaction when a visible enemy fighter within one inch of them makes a disengage action, but before that fighter moves away. So this is where they're in close combat and they're basically fleeing or they're, they're disengaging from combat, should we say. Uh, roll a dice on a four plus, allocate D6 damage points to that enemy fighter. So again, on a 50-50, you can say, I mean, on average, it'll be what? three or four wounds that you're doing to someone that chooses to disengage from you. Again, very, very good. I mean, all, all three of these universal reactions, I think are actually really, really useful. Um, so no, I really, really like those. Um, the next thing I want to look at now, um, before I actually go on, we're already on page uh, 70, as you can see there, all before here is so much lore, as you can see here, um, now, if you want me to do a lore video, then please just pop that in the comments and I'll be happy to do a lore video for you. But this one is basically just looking at some of the, 
the new mechanics in the actual game. So we're not looking at the law in this one. But, you know, if you guys want to see me do one, then that is absolutely fine. Right, the next thing I actually wanted to um, point out in this is actually a couple of four-way battles that are available in this book. So there's There Can Be Only One and Lord of the Tower. Um, both of them very different, and I'll explain why. So the first one, as you can see, it's four players. Um, try and get the angle right so it's not reflecting. There we go. So, as you can see... Uh, when a player's leader is taken down, that player is out of the battle and all fighters from their warband are taken down. So if, you're, if your leader's dead, you're out, basically. But then also, in addition, at the end of each battle round, if any of the warband leaders are within four inches of the battlefield edge, they are taken down. So I love that because it means you can't just hide your leaders like around the edge and just surround them by your own fighters because they they can't if they're at the edge they're gonna die which uh, which i really like so you have to kind of get stuck in with them um and basically this just carries on until um there you go when only one player remains that player wins the battle so it's just a fight to the death and i really like that this one here is uh even more interesting i think so it's called uh, Lord of the Tower, and you can see in the centre there is that icon there saying the tower. So before you begin, um, you and your opponents have to pick one piece of a, a terrain. That terrain has to have platforms, um, at least one, but the more the better, and I'll explain why in a minute. That becomes the tower, so you place that in the middle, and then you still draw your uh, terrain cards and things like that and place them. Obviously, if anything goes on the trend card where the tower is, then you just disregard that. Um, but what this does, let me just get the angle right again. So, it's only three battle rounds, so it's quite a quick one. Although there's four people, so I mean, that's technically uh, a lot longer. Um, so the battle round ends, locate the highest fighter on the tower. That fighter's player wins the battle. So it's literally who can get the highest on the tower. I think that would be quite fun, really, especially with four of you. Um, the only the only thing, though, with this, and there's no twists or anything, they just generate twists as normal, but a character that can fly can literally just jump up to the top because when you're moving, you don't measure the vertical distances that they're moving because they can fly. You only measure the vertical. So, to be honest, it seems like if you've got something that can fly, you're going to win, but then I suppose... If you're again, if it's two warbands that can fly, um, then they're going to have to battle it out against each other. But say if just one of you had units that can fly and the rest of them didn't, then you're going to stand a massive advantage, I would think, anyway. Um, but yeah, but I thought those were really, really cool. I always like new ways of playing games, and one of the best new ways of playing games or unique ways of playing is where it's not just two on two. Uh, sorry, where where it's not just one on one. I like you know three player battles, four player battles. Um, and things like that. So that's why these two really, really stood out for me. Right, so the next thing that I wanted to go over is what we love here in um, Age of Warhammer, and that is narrative play. Um, so there's a whole section on here on how to do a campaign, and it's, it's all very narrative-driven, which is something we absolutely love. Um, so the first stage of a campaign, so I'm just gonna go through the first, the steps of a campaign, some of the uh, mechanics that really interest me, um, and hopefully you'll get like a sort of a broad overview in what a campaign looks like with the new Warcry. Um, so obviously this campaign is actually based all around, um, it doesn't actually say it on the front, but all around uh, Narwood, um, where you've got you know warbands battling in Narwood to try and explore and get artifacts and things like that. Um, so that is the basis of the campaign. Obviously, the first thing you need to do is to create a warband roster. Um, it's very, very simple. It tells you the steps and what you need to do, the limitations you have. So for example, um, you need at least three fighters, no more than 15. They all have to have the same um, faction rune to start with, you can gain allies and thralls and things like that later on, which are from different 
um, war bands, but initially they all have to be in the same one. Um, you can only have one hero to start with. Again, you can gain more heroes later on, I think to a maximum of three. Um, and the total points cannot exceed 1,000 points. Uh, so all fairly, fairly straightforward. Uh, your hero straight away gets a um, heroic trait, which if we look at these bottom ones here, they are all pretty good to be honest. Uh, so you've got add one to the attack characteristics, uh, add one to move. Each time this fighter activates, you can remove D3 damage alloc points allocated to them. Very, very cool, so they get to heal a little bit. Uh, if this fighter is included in your warband, gain one additional wild dice at the start of the battle, um, which is pretty good for gaining initiative. Each time an attack action scores any critical hits on this fighter, one of these critical hits becomes a hit instead. So that's really, really good to try and keep them alive. As I mentioned before, the critical hits can be quite savage. Um, and then skilled commander, once per battle, the fighter can use the inspiring presence ability without needing um, or using any ability dice. Now, I believe the inspiring presence rule is where you can get another of your warband to activate straight away after your leader. So you get to have two basically fighting at the same time. Uh, so the next step is to choose your first quest. Now these campaigns are full of quests and basically what they are is current objectives for your warband. Um, it's got an example of one up here and it actually suggests if you don't know what to do to start with then this is the one you pick, Treasures of the Narwood. And this is basically about um, sending your fighters out to try and find an artifact which you can then equip on one of your, on, on one of your people. Um, it's very simple on how it does, so um, while embarked upon this quest in step 5 of the aftermath sequence, I'll go over that in a little bit, um, you can pick up to 3 fighters from your warband roster and send them forth to search for an artifact. To do so, roll a dice for each fighter you picked, add in 1 to each roll if you won your last campaign battle. So things like that I love because it actually shows that when, you, when you're doing your battles it actually matters if you win or lose them. Um, because if you win, then obviously doing things like these quests, the chance of you succeeding is increased. Um, then add the rolls together. This score represents your progress. Keep record of your progress on your quest log. In addition, on an unmodified roll of one, the fighter being rolled for is attacked by something within the Narwood. Make an injury roll for that fighter. I'll show you the injury table uh, a little bit later. <clears throat> Once your progress totals 10 or more, so I mean really you could do that in one go, uh, you can complete this quest and your warband has discovered the artifact. Roll on the Treasures of Narwood table to see what you find. If the result you roll is an artifact that a fighter in your warband already bears, roll again until the result is an artifact no fighter in your warband bears. So very, very cool. So basically a way of just basically finding new equipment um, and some of the some of the things you can find are, are really, really quite cool. Um, now finishing touches. So this is one thing that is new, is you've got encampments now. Um, now everyone, when you start an encampment, you'll start in the same place, which is, let me just find the wording for it. It's basically on the outskirts. There you go. Outskirts of the Narwood. It says it right there. Outskirts of the Narwood. Um, now you, you get no benefits from having that encampment. So, it's in your best interest to try and get encampments further within the Narwood because you gain benefits from it. Um, and actually, let me try, I'm gonna find the table that has that on there because it'd be better to explain when I've actually got it in front of me. Um, but some of them are very, very powerful. So it really is in your best interest to kind of venture forth. Here we go. So, now there are more locations which are related to some quests apparently uh, that you can have. Um, where you can find other encampments, but these are the common ones. So you can see there's quite a few, and it's got a nice little map there showing them all. Obviously, they're not in those locations because they're quite generic. But if you look, so this table down here is your points limit. So this is how many you can actually send in a battle. So if you're at this dead Narlock Grove, you can add an additional 150 points to all your fights. Which is, which is awesome. Down here, 250, 200, and then on all of these, you do get other sort of um, bonuses as well. Um, but that, I think that's great, especially if you're going up against someone, because if I'll explain later on, but there, there are um, campaign arcs that you can go down, which is basically like a quest 
um, within the campaign. Um, but I'll go, I'll go through that in more detail. But in some of them, you're against like another player. If you can take more um, more fighters in your warband, then you're already at an advantage. So <laughs> why wouldn't you? Um, but if you're in one of those other locations, then they can. Uh, there are some negatives as well. Um, but I'll go through that in a little bit. Um, okay, so you've got fighting campaign battles. That's all fairly straightforward. The aftermath sequence. So there's a lot to do in this aftermath sequence. And I think there's about seven steps or so. Um, it's pretty crazy. So first step is gaining glory. So this is how you gain glory. And you use that glory to then buy things um, or to increase your roster. Say, for example, if you want to get a new hero, you have, depending on how many points it is, you have to spend glory to get that. Um, so that's what the glory is for. You got, here's the injury table. So you have to roll this on any um, fighters that get taken down. You basically roll two D6s and one of them is the tens, one of them is the singles or the ones, I don't know what you called it. But so you got from 11 up to 66. 66 is the only one, and oh, that's survive. Um, killed, it's only you know, 11, 12 and 13. So you're very unlikely to actually die, but they're all, you've got all these different injuries that you can get and they can't recover for them straight away. They can only recover for them after the next fight. Um, so for at least one fight, if you choose to take them, you don't have to take them, but for at least one battle round, they will have this injury, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, what we got after this? So step step three is earn renown. So renown is basically like XP for your individual fighters. With that renown, you can do some things for free, like some the reactions. You can do them for free. Um, if your hero gets a renown, they have the um, opportunity to gain more heroic traits. So I mean that's what it's detailing down this side here. Um, so basically the way that works is if your hero gains a renown, um, you can go on a quest. If you then succeed on that quest, you get a, another heroic trait and you can have up to three heroic traits. Obviously they start with one, as I mentioned earlier on, but they can gain two more. And you saw some of them, some of them are, you know, can be quite game changing. Um, so that's really good. <clears throat> Step four is further your quest. So that's if you're the current quest you're doing there's anything you need to do for it so you know for that that one where it was um trying to find an artifact in the Narwood, then that's when you'd send your fighters out is it at that step there um it's got a pin on here giving up on a quest so if you can choose at any point to give up on a quest and then pick a new one obviously you lose all of your progress on that existing quest but there are some occasions where you might want to change it could be because you don't feel like you're ever going to be able to complete it or there's something more important that comes up um, one of them being the encampment which i'll talk about in a sec uh so yeah send fighters forth so even if you're not doing a quest you can send fighters forth uh to explore the area um you can make them look for monsters thralls, all that kind of stuff but then if they go out on the to explore, uh, you've got all of these results. Again, it's a, they, they call it a D66, um, which is you roll two dice, one of them's the tens, one of them's the ones, and then whatever result you get, this is what you find. So you can see all these locations. So when you find a location, that means you can, if, if you've got this, the right, I think it's renown, oh no, glory. There you go, you can spend 15 glory. So if you've got enough glory, then you can move to lo those locations. Which is pretty cool. So you can send your fighters out to explore. Um, and then it's going on to the encampment. Um, so the next stage is managing your warband. So this is basically where you can um, hire new people. Um, there's also recovery roles. So this is where you can actually recover from injuries, which are quite good. So make, make a recover roll by rolling the dice for each injury a fighter has. 
So fighters can have more than one injury. They do stack up. They can't have the same one twice, um, but they can stack up. Actually, if, if you roll the same injury that a fighter already has on an injury roll, then it's just discarded. I think it's counted as just like a flesh wound, which doesn't do anything, um, which is quite good. <laughs> you can't like break your arm even more kind of thing. Um, except for injuries suffered in this aftermath sequence. So this is where I mentioned before, you cannot recover from an injury straight away. Uh, on a one to three, the injury being rolled for persists and the fighter continues to suffer from its effects. On a four plus, the injury heals and is removed from the fighter. But then down here, which is a very interesting point, if a fighter was not included in your warband in your last campaign battle, add one to the recovery rolls made for that fighter's injuries. So if they don't go uh, out on the battle, then they've got more chance of recovering. Makes total sense to me, so that's good. Uh, perish rolls. So some, one, some of the things that you can find are actual uh, perishable. So they'll be like potions and things like that. Um, if they are, then you have to roll on these after every turn to see if they've perished, basically. Uh, adding and removing fighters. Here's the table that I mentioned before, where to add a fighter, that's how much glory it's going to cost you. Um, according to how many points they have. It's got a table here on your limits. So you can only have 20 fighters, three heroes or allies and one monster. Uh, managing artifacts, so that's where you can swap out artifacts with others. Uh, fighters can only carry one, but if say you find a better one for your leader, but he's already got one, he can unequip that, give it to someone else and take that one. So that's basically just managing your inventory. Cool, right, and the next step, which this one is awesome. Let's get the angle right. Make the encampment check. Now, while you're in the outskirts of the Narwood, so that is the encampment that you start in, you do not have to make these checks. Um, so it, it is a safe space. It's the only safe space is on the outside. As soon as you're in the Narwood, you have to start making these. So these are basically encampment check. So in this step, make an encampment check by rolling two dice. Do not add the scores together. Instead, check if either or both of the dice scores are one. Each roll of one is a fail. The first fail you roll for your encampment changes its state from secure to threatened. The second fail you roll for your encampment changes its state from threatened to compromised. Um, and it details up here, basically, that means if both of them are, are one, you go from secured all the way down to compromised in one go. Because that's how quickly things can turn in the Narnwood. Narnwood, sorry. So, if your camp has the status of threatened, when your encampment is threatened, it has no direct effect, but is a sign that you should probably start looking for a location to relocate your encampment to. So this is where I was mentioning before about um, changing your quest. So if you become threatened, you might think, actually, I'm going to need to try and find a new location. Um, that's where you might want to change your quest kind of thing. Uh, compromised, so this is this is where it's obviously quite bad. While your um, warband's encampment is compromised, the following rules apply. The location bonus for your warband's encampment no longer is in effect. Your points limit for each campaign battle is 950, so it's actually less than 1,000. So you're definitely going to be at a disadvantage. Um, and you do not make encampment checks. Obviously the reason for that is because you cannot get any worse. So I really, really like that. So it's not only about fighting, there's quite a lot that you have to manage in between your, um, in between your actual battles. Um, there's a section here all about your quest. So again, you've got the treasures of Narwood, which we've already been over there. Um, there are some other universal ones. There's Ascension to Glory, up this one up here, which is basically how your hero gains um, another trait. So once they've got, once they've gained renowned, you can send them on this quest. You've got secure a powerful ally, explore the Narwood, fight for glory, hunt the beast. Obviously, this is where you you hunt a monster, and you can then add. If you beat the monster, you can then add it to your um, to your roster, which is very very cool. And to do that, there is actually. I'm not going to go through it all in detail here, but there is 
its own battle plan there, as you can see. That's very, very cool. <clears throat> and then, as I said, there are quests for each Grand Alliance. So there's obviously Chaos, Death, Order, and Destruction. So there are specific ones to there. And there are specific ones to your individual um, warbands as well, which is cool. So it's, it's quite unique. Now, the last thing I wanted to go over really, really quickly with you guys is campaign arcs. Now, this is something I absolutely love um, within the campaign system. So you can choose to go on a what's called a campaign arc. And it is a set amount of missions with a set objective. Um, if you win, you get certain rewards. If you lose, then obviously you don't. But it'll be against other players, uh, mainly. Some of them might be cooperative. Um, but in this book, you get two um, choices of campaign arcs. Now, you can only ever go on one campaign arc at a time. Um, so, the two on these ones. So, you've got the Path of Ventalex. Uh, in this campaign arc, one warband has secured a Van Telex map that tells of a treasure hoard hidden within the depths of the Narwood. As they search for it, their rivals are hot on their heels. This campaign arc is for two players and lasts for three battles, during which a set sequence of unique battle plans is played throughout to sorry through to determine the outcome. So that's like two people basically trying to get to a treasure. They're racing to get to a treasure. Uh, this one here, the, the uh, I think it's Chotek Valley. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. I'm probably um, butchering it, to be honest. In this campaign arc, the shifting canopy of the Narwood has opened a path to a long lost valley rumored to hold a shard of Talaxis, the crashed Seraphim temple ship. This campaign arc is for four players and ends in a climactic battle involving all warbands. Your rivals aren't the only threat, however, as you'll come face to face with the savage Seraphon that fiercely guard these grounds too. Now, when I read that, I was thinking, oh my God, there's gonna be a Seraphon war cry um, band coming out soon. However, if I just skip to that bit, The Savage Seraphim, so it's actually just got their rules here and they are four existing models, unfortunately. I thought that would have been an incredible way of them hinting that maybe there's going to be a uh, a new warband coming. And a Seraphim, like an up-to-date, you know, new model Seraphim warband, I think would be sensational. Maybe they will still do it. Obviously, the Narwood is very Seraphim heavy because they're, they're trying to find that, um, that crashed ship, mainly. Yeah, there's other treasures as well, of course. But, um, yeah, as I said, it would have been good if it was its own warband, but um, it is just using old models. Um, now, one thing um, I would like to, to include with those arcs is that obviously there's two in this core book, but in other publications there is going to be more. In the Rotten Ruin... Um, campaign book there is that there's an arc in there which sounds very very interesting um but i'm going to talk about that more on another video so um that concludes this uh quick review for today uh please let me know if there's anything you want me to go over in more detail um your thoughts on the new mechanics in this game are you guys going to pick it up i know the uh, the initial box set some people have been saying is quite pricey but I mean I, I, I personally think it's very good value for money the terrain's very good and the two warbands I think are sensational if you're splitting that with you know another person you do the terrain together and you pick one warband each the price goes down quite quickly so I think it's very good um, but I'd love to hear your comments um, and as I said we're going to be doing some more war cry content very soon I'm going to review the Rotten Ruin book. Um, there's also some other stuff which will be coming out soon. So it might be a good idea for you guys to turn your notification bells on so that you can be notified whenever we upload a new video. Thank you very, very much for watching and take care.